Well, again, I hope you enjoyed that. That is fresh. Uh, just got it the, uh, the day before yesterday. It's not been shared yet, but I thought it was so appropriate here. Again, on behalf of all my colleagues back in Philadelphia, I want to thank you for having us. I represent about 1,100 great people that I have the privilege of working with every day, and we care very much about what it is we do for a living. And we're very concerned, like you are, about uh, the, the future state of what it is that's so important to all of us and our freedoms. I can't begin to relate to what the issues are that you face here in Greece. I don't want to pretend to be an expert on that at all. So if you don't mind, I'll try to stay to where I do know a little bit more, and that are some of the issues that are taking place in the States. Uh, you know, I've been in this business for over three decades now and have seen the good times, the medium times, and the really tough times. But it doesn't matter what the times are. What's at stake is so important that failure is not an option. So what I'd like to do today is just share with you uh, a few things that, starting with the issue about um, the industry itself and looking in the rearview mirror, because I think there are lessons to be learned about the sins of our past. In other words, if you went to the doctor and you had a diagnosis of what was wrong with you, it might help to understand what were you doing, smoking, drinking, whatever it might have been that helped cause these problems for you so you can think about how to avoid them in the future. Then I want to focus a little bit on, um, on the things that we're doing in Philadelphia because it is, as Anna said, it's a unique structure and we're very blessed to have that, yet it's no guarantee. So I wish more than anything I was telling my wife that when I came here that I had a little chest that said, hey, media in Athens and Greece, here's the answer, but, but we don't have the answers but we have a unique structure that is giving us the opportunity to have a little bit more time and a little bit more investment to figure it out. So I want to spend some time talking about that. I want to talk about what happens if we do fail, because that's a really important part going into the end, uh, talking about storytelling, and I'll, and I'll touch on that, and then talk about some of the things that are taking place in the industry that at least from my perspective, that I think show some promise or things that are being tried to try to help find, at the end of the day, what we all want. And what we all want is a sustainable business model that supports free and independent journalists. That's what we want. We're looking for something that creates a revenue stream that will ensure the viability of independent journalists to serve the people in our communities. Whether you're in Athens, Greece, or you're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that's what we're really trying to solve for. This is a, a, a slogan that, uh, that we developed in partnership in Philadelphia with our owner, the, uh, the Linfest Institute. And I think in these very few words, in these very few words become the essence of not only what it is that we're fighting for, but at the end of the day, what it is we're going to need to accomplish in order to win. You know, because we always realized and we always felt as journalists that, and as news organizations, that we knew what we did was important. We knew that it was important for the communities. And so we would determine for our communities what news they should get. We would be the arbiters of what was important. And we would determine that. And this is what you need. In other words, here's what we're going to feed you for dinner. This is what you're going to get. But importantly, this is the change. Now more than ever, the news needs you. Because if we don't get the individual support in our communities of people understanding what's at stake and get them to understand that without their commitment, without their financial support, what they have come to enjoy or appreciate, hopefully, that we give them every day, that meal that we serve them, unless they're willing to pay for that and support that, it's going to go away. And so you need the news, but now more than ever, the news needs you. And that is a theme that I would, I'll come back to at the very end to talk about in terms of storytelling. One of the keys, though, and again, we'll talk about it, is that the meal that we serve them, we might want to ask them what's important to them, what do they like to eat, what, what diet is important to them, what nourishes them, what's valuable to them, if we're going to ask to have this kind of relationship. So I want to talk a little bit about Philadelphia because Philadelphia, and I'm not sure if, if any of you are familiar or have been to the city before, 
But Philadelphia, the Inquirer in Philadelphia, uh, actually we have three publications that we have. We have the Philadelphia Inquirer, we have the Philadelphia Daily News, which is a tabloid newspaper, and then we have our website, philly.com, which next week becomes inquirer.com. On uh, Tuesday, excuse me, on Sunday, this, this Sunday, on June 2nd, uh, we will celebrate our 190th anniversary. So the Philadelphia Inquirer has been around for 190 years. Pretty amazing. But in the last 10 years or so, the Philadelphia Inquirer had eight different owners. So massive disruption through our organization. Buyouts, sold, bankruptcy, hedge funds, different ownership changes. And so I think about, this was before I came, when I think about my colleagues, I think about the whiplash that they went through. And it was horrible. And so along came, about four years ago, a gentleman named Jerry Lenfest. And Jerry was, he was a, a, a multi-billionaire, started uh, really on his own as a young lawyer. He went to work for a gentleman named Walter Annenberg, who was very famous, an ambassador to England and uh, owned uh, the, uh, um, the uh, TV guide, uh, was the publisher and owner of the Inquirer at one point. But anyway, Jerry made his billions in cable television when it first started. And then he and his wife, Marguerite, who was his partner in the business, when they sold their business for billions of dollars, they were very unique because they decided that while they were alive, they wanted to give away every dollar that they had earned while they were alive to a good causes. And they flew coach on the airline. They took public transportation. They lived in the same 2,000 plus square foot home that they moved into in 1966. They only got air conditioning in that home a few years ago. And yet they had given $125 million to the Columbia University in New York. They'd given over $100 million to the art museum, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, at the end of his life, and we lost Jerry last uh, August, Jerry was approached about being yet one of the new, another new owner of the Inquirer. And so he and a, a partner uh, ended up buying the Inquirer uh, in uh, May, of, uh, ninth, or excuse me, May of 2014. The same week that he and his partner bought it, his partner died in a plane crash. And so, and his partner really wanted to run the paper every day. And so Jerry then uh, found himself at 84 years old as the sole owner of the newspaper. And he, has, having been in Philadelphia, he'd seen all the turmoil that had gone on. And he'd also become aware of what was at stake if the newspaper failed. And so Jerry, I received a phone call from Jerry one day out of the blue. I had retired from the industry. And he said, I'm 84 years old. I'm now the sole owner of this newspaper. And I need help. Would you please come talk to me? But what he really wanted to do is he said, I'm going to not be on this earth very long. I want to find a sustainable business model long after I'm gone to ensure that the people of Philadelphia never have to go without independent journalists to serve them. And so what he did is he created a new structure. And that structure was a, he took our, our, our company that he had just purchased and he donated it to a nonprofit. He created the nonprofit, then donated it. Then he donated $20 million of endowment. Then he added another $40 million. And essentially, in Philadelphia, it's a grand experiment because we are a for-profit newspaper, The Inquirer, that is essentially owned by a nonprofit that has a large endowment. We want it to be for-profit ourselves because it changes our ability, it, it ensures the ability for us to be able to endorse politically, our access to capital markets, but we also wanted to be entrepreneurial. But what the ownership of a nonprofit allows us to do is to receive funding for experimentation. And so our mission is to find that sustainable business model to support journalism, not just in Philadelphia, but around the U.S. and around the world, so that anything that we do, anything that we do that we receive funding for, if it works, we share it with the rest of the industry for free. And so that unique structure has given us a platform where as a for-profit public benefit corporation, we know, and all of my colleagues, when we come to work every day, we don't work for some, some hedge fund, we don't work for a shareholder, we don't work for the bank. 
We come to work every day and we feel like deeply we work for the people of Philadelphia. We want to do journalism that makes their life better. And because we can speak with that conviction, it also allows us to go out and raise money for people who want to support that work. And we, we focus in three areas. Three things that we focus on with the funding that we seek. The first is obviously high impact journalism. The type of deep investigative journalism that's so important to communities. The kind the government doesn't often like to see coming. The kind that many people in power in business don't like to see coming. But the kind that is really, really fundamentally important to a free democracy. So through funding and donations right now, we have built our investigative team to where in the Enquirer itself, we now have an investigative team of 13 full-time people. And so they are doing, they were the runner up for the Pulitzer this last year with a series called Toxic City, where they went into and, and discovered lead paint, not only in, uh, in homes, but in playgrounds, uh, lead dust, and then also in the schools. So it, it allows us to fund that journalism. And then just this month, we're launching another new investigative journalism team in our state capital, and that will be 12 full-time journalists. Currently, we have two. All of it paid for with philanthropy because we have a powerful story to tell, and it resonates with people that say, you know what? We need to hold our public officials accountable if I'm going to give money to the art museum or I'm going to give money to a university, this is every bit as important. And so a second area is news and technology because it's evolving so quickly, our storytelling abilities need to evolve, but also how people receive the information is evolving very quickly. Therefore, the lift on the technology, both the content management systems, but also what you hold in your hand and the experience of apps or other ways people deliver it, needs to be state of the art, and it's very expensive. And when money is tight, this is another category of business that we will seek donations for, articulating the what and why, because you can do the best journalism in the world, but if people, whoops, if people don't have a good experience receiving it, it's not, it doesn't have the impact. And finally, the third is, and this is important too, as a public benefit corporation, we think about all the audiences in our, in our community. Too often, publications are very focused on a niche audience. But we know that we need to diversify our audience. We know that we need younger people. We need, know that we need more minorities. We know a lot of things that, that need to change in terms of us to spread the number of people we have impact for. And in order to do that, guess what? Our newsroom itself needs to reflect that. So about a year ago, we had 50 of our colleagues that took buyouts to leave our news organization. After long careers, they were all self-selected, raised their hands, and then we were able to hire in 45 new journalists that looked very different with very different skill sets. But it was a purposeful uh, approach to try to have our newsrooms and our journalists look more like the entirety of our community. And so we hope that pays dividends. So again, we call it philanthropy with a purpose. If we are able to, and I'll come back to this at the end of, of what we're, our conversation, if we are able to, as you are able to, articulate why do you exist? Why do you exist? And what is it if you had funding you could do a better job with? You might be surprised where people, right now the transaction is, and, and Anna and Demetrius were sharing with me, maybe it's a euro or euro uh, 50, that you buy the paper every day, deal's done, right? We had our transaction, you're good, I'm good. No, it's not enough anymore, right? Because they don't understand on the other side of that euro, euro and a half transaction, you're starving. And that, that that product may not be there the next day. And so being able to have that conversation about why you need more investment to continue your work is critically important. And the interesting thing is, people just aren't aware. They're not, it's not that they don't care, they're indifferent to it. In our newsroom, one of the things we talk about is one of the beauties of the blessings and the curse of the internet, right? Blessings and the curse of the internet um, and digital distribution is you know who read you, how long they read you, what stories they were interested in, 
what stories led to them buying a subscription with you. You have so much data that before was all based on intuition. So when somebody buys a print product, we know very little about them. We may be able to do a public survey, but that is subject to error that, you know, you, you wouldn't want to bet your house on that, right? But with the digital information and the data collection that we do, we know everything just about in terms of the impact a particular story has. And so in our newsroom, our goal in our community is to think about the entirety of the community and to try to think about what is it that becomes indispensable to people every day. So one of your colleagues, I was trying to, your first name again? No, the, yes. Christos. Christos. So Christos uh, was kind enough to send me a few questions the other day about our future and our challenges collectively. And I ended my comments to Christo with a story about every day where we have a habit, right? Every day, most in the room. How many people have to get a coffee or an espresso once or twice every day? Raise your hand. Once or twice every day, a coffee or an espresso? Most people, right? And you pay, what, a euro, euro 50 for the coffee, the espresso, right? No problem. No problem. Boy, the day would be a bad day without that, right? So somehow that little cup of espresso or that little cup of coffee for a euro, or euro 50 has become kind of indispensable to you, right? I need it. I need it. So we want our journalism every day to become indispensable to people and people to be willing to pay for it. And so we've broken our definition of indispensable into these three categories in our newsroom. The first is that notion of being ambitious, about really the, the whole notion of public service. And this is where we focus on a lot of high impact investigative journalism. What is the kind of journalism that if it were not for our teams out there, our, our people out there digging in and trying to tell the stories, these stories would not be told. And more importantly, it's, it's like the comment that the, uh, the, the gentleman made in the previous video. More importantly, it's, the problem isn't that there's lead in the water. The problem is there's lead in the water that nobody knows about. And so that's really what this is about. It's not the problem that there are bad things going on in Athens or around Greece, corrupt things. That's bad. What's worse is if people don't know about it. And so this is that whole bucket that we spend a lot of time trying to think about how to be the watchdog to improve the life and protect the lives and the freedoms and the economy for the people in our, in our community. Second is that whole notion of being useful. Just when somebody gets up every day, are we telling stories that make them and help them navigate their life better? That can be consumer information, obviously things like you know, restaurant reviews, et cetera, but things that are actually of use to people that they think every day, you know what, what's, you know, everybody checks the weather to see what that is because it becomes a useful habit. We want to make sure that we're thinking about that diverse audience that we serve. What are the things that every day would make us have a little bit of usefulness in their lives? And finally, that notion of what's engaging. Because, again, depending on the, the device that people are receiving or where they are, the type of storytelling that you do and increasingly, it's not just words on paper, but it's words on paper with video, or it's words on paper with and video and, and, and uh, graphics digitally, and it's click-throughs and it's related stories, those types of things. So that whole notion of, and if you like this story and you're interested, here were four other stories that we did about this subject recently. So that whole notion of engagement. So again, to be indispensable, to become a habit every day that people value us, it isn't a one-off of, and we can't think, I believe, collectively as news organizations or as journalists, we shouldn't be thinking about each story is a one-off. Each story should be part of a continuum of a body of work of what our value proposition is on an ongoing basis in a relationship with one of our citizens. Think about that. Instead of just that one story and that one-off of a particular beat, it is a part of a package of information. It's part of a meal, a daily meal, every day that brings nourishment to a citizen. 
And you want to think about it that way. And you want to think about that connection. And I think that becomes very, very important. So further, and again, this is one of the new tools in our newsroom, is we're taking that notion of being indispensable. And if you think about there's a journey with an audience, there's a journey with a reader, right? And many of you have seen when people talk about the funnel from somebody who just came across your information, maybe on the internet, maybe they picked up a paper while they were waiting at a doctor's office and they read something. It was more serendipitous that they came across your information. So you've reached somebody, but there's not that level of engagement. So in the funnel that people talk about, it's from exposure to engagement to subscription or habit, to, to paying for it. Be to, to when it's become indispensable. And so with the three categories I talked about before too, we're working with each of our journalists in almost a coaching fashion because we have so much data to be able to look each day at how many different, and we, we put scores on these so that of a 100% score that we look at for a journalist's work and helping them see their work, you know, they're not getting us, they're not getting, it's, it's not like it's going to cost them their job here or there. It's just a matter of showing them the impact of their work. So each of them then, we, we rank these, and I hopefully I won't repeat all of those, but you can see on the screen the various aspects of what we look at. But it's a matter of in the various three buckets of the funnel, how much time did people spend? Did people share that information? If so, why? If not, why not? And the beauty of this is, the beauty of it is, depending on whether you're an independent journalist, it's more difficult perhaps, but if you're working with another team of journalists, the beauty of it is, is you can look at your colleagues' scores and you can see what stories they did that had a particular, uh, a lot of, uh, of recirculation use or what stories resonated more with women, what stories resonate, so you can compare notes and learn from each other in real time about what types of storytelling works best for people. One of the things I wanted to say too is um, one of the big changes we had, and it was very, it sounds easy, and it sounded easy when I first said it, but when I came to Philadelphia in um, in October of 2015, uh, at Jerry's invitation, we were, as I said, three different uh, prop, three different publications: the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Daily News, and Philly.com. And on the third floor, that Anna and Anna and Demetrius and other people that visit us, on that same floor in the same building, we had three separate newsrooms. There was a newsroom for the Inquirer. There was a newsroom for the Daily News, and there was a newsroom for Philly.com. And so if there was a, a story with the mayor, they sent someone, they sent two people, they sent someone. It picked, picked the subject. Worse than that, they all hated each other. Why? And it wasn't all bad, because they were competing with one another, right? And competition can be good, because it gives you that fire in your belly. And so when I came, the first thing I said is, look, we, we can no longer have three separate newsrooms covering Philadelphia. But it wasn't just economic reasons, it was also strategic reasons. Because the journalists and the leaders of the newsrooms, every day they were waking up and they were thinking about my product. They were waking up thinking about the Enquirer. I work for the Enquirer. They were thinking about the Daily News. I work for the Daily News. I'm doing stories for the Daily News. And so my simple ask of them was, in the new world, we're going to go from three newsrooms to one newsroom. And what I want you to think about is, if somebody came to you, the newsroom leadership, and said, here, I want to give you $28 million annually as a startup, and you get to build the newsroom of the future, what would that look like? Because I think too many news organizations, they understand the challenges in the past, but we think about it, how can we incrementally get a little bit different, a little bit different, a little bit different. If you were a startup, knowing what you know today, and you were building a newsroom of the future, 
you would be very different in terms of how you structured that, the skill sets you needed, et cetera. And so in this particular case, we said, here's $28 million. You have 250 journalists. Build the newsroom of the future. So that was step one. Obviously, we were trying to think about all the, and maintain all the employees we had, but it was a new way of thinking and putting people in the right, do we have the right beats, do we have enough people in investigation, do we have et cetera, et cetera. But the more poignant thing I think was, and the other ask we have, the second ask is this. When you come to work every day, you no longer work for the daily news. When you come to work, you no longer work for philly.com. When you come to work, I'm sorry, you no longer work for the Enquirer. When you come to work every day as a journalist, you work for the people of Philadelphia. In this case here, you would say, you work for the people of Athens. And what you want to do is create journalism that is valuable in their life every day, that becomes indispensable, that they will, they will appreciate and be willing to support, either through a single copy or buying the paper or making a donation, et cetera. That is the difference maker. And it's incumbent upon us not just to do that good journalism, but to invite them to participate more. So as I mentioned, um, I, actually I was wrong. Sunday, what's, what's the first? Tomorrow? Is tomorrow the first? Tomorrow we're 190 years old. Tomorrow. Should know my own birthday, right? Um, so this. We, were, we knew our 190th anniversary was coming up, and one of our editors was digging through a prof, uh, some, some archives, and we had never seen this before. Nobody knew this at all. But we found the original copy, the first edition of the Philadelphia Inquirer from 190 years ago. And one of the co-founders, a gentleman named John Norville, had this quote on the front page of the first edition of the Inquirer and fell in love with it. We fell in love with it. In a free state, there should always be an inquirer asking on behalf of the people. Why? What? Isn't that powerful? It's, it's as important today or more than it was 190 years ago. So we dusted off this, we dusted off this old quote from the original founder or co-founder, and this has become kind of a mantra with us that you need the news and now more than ever the news needs you. And this notion of why are we here? Why do we do what we do? Which leads me to this. The next thing I wanted to talk about was the consequences. I'll go back to that one if I can. The consequences of what's at stake if we fail. Okay, What's at stake if we fail? There was a I think about this all the time. And one of the reasons, you know, I'll, I'll admit I'm a chicken, right? You know what I, when I say I'm a chicken, I'm scared. Because this was a business I grew up in and a business that I loved deeply. But there came a point about five years ago or six years ago where it was becoming so frustrating every day to come in and be managing decline. You know, be managing decline every day and knowing that I didn't know the answers to how to fix this thing. And so finally I said, look, I'm getting older in life. I don't know the answers. It's becoming more frustrating. I think I'll retire. So I did. And my wife said, no, you're not retiring. Go back to work. So no, but, but then it came from Jerry. But my point was what haunted me as somebody who loved this very much is what's at stake if we fail? Our chair, the chairman of our board of the Philadelphia Inquirer Public Benefit Corporation, the chairman of our board is a very unique guy. He's about 40, early 40s, mid 40s. His name is Josh Koppelman. Josh Koppelman, while he was at the University of Pennsylvania as a student, was an entrepreneur. And he started a company called Half.com while he was in school. He sold Half.com to eBay for five or six hundred million dollars or something while he was still in school. Pretty good starter kid out of college, right? 
Um, and he started another firm called, uh, another uh, startup called Infonautics, et cetera. So he was very, very entrepreneurial. Fast forward today, um, Josh had a pretty big week a couple weeks ago. So Josh had become a venture capitalist. You know, he went from starting up companies to becoming a VC. And if you look uh, in the States anyway, you'll always see Josh, this 40 something year old guy, um, as one of the top three or four venture capitalists in America. So he was the first money in something called LinkedIn. Uh, there were other things, uh, but there was this other idea. He has offices in his main office in Philadelphia. He's got offices in San Francisco. This other outfit, they had this idea and he thought it was a pretty good idea. So he not only gave them some money, but they needed some office space to start. So he gave them the office space, this little thing called Uber. And they had seven or eight cars at the time when they started. So he had a pretty good week a couple weeks ago. My point being though, Josh as an entrepreneur, he was asked to join our board when Jerry formed it the same time I did in 2015. And he was just a board member and he kept saying no. Why would I do that? Why would I join this board? I put companies like this out of a business for a living. I take legacy organizations and I completely disrupt them for a living. Why, you know, so this organization is dying. I'm the type of person who puts that out of its misery and creates something better. But after a few board meetings, the aha hit him. What's at stake if this doesn't work? And it changed him. It was, it was, like, it was like his epiphany to where now he is the hardest advocate for the fact that we cannot fail at what we're doing, that journalism is that important. And so we need to bring the same type of entrepreneurial skills that a startup uses to try to save journalism, though there's no guarantee. And the lesson that he tells is something they refer to often in the startup community is in, in, in any business, in any business, and I never thought about this, in any business you're one of two things at all times. You are either default alive or you're default dead, right? You're either a default alive or default dead, meaning the course that you're on currently, if you don't do anything to significantly change the course, you either have a growing viable business that is alive, or you have a business that is in decline or there's not enough nourishment there for it to succeed and therefore it will die. You are default dead. We, as an industry, are default dead. And the more we recognize that, and I think everyone does, the more it creates that sense of urgency. But it's not enough that we recognize it. It's not enough that we agonize over it. What's important is this. I was hit with a, a, a study two years ago, 2017. I never knew this. The Freedom House out of DC did a study. And what that study showed, and I, st I still have a hard time believing it, but it showed that on the planet Earth that we all occupy together, on the planet Earth, every human being who lives here, only 13% of the world's population every day enjoys a free and independent press that serves the, their community. Only 13% has a completely free and independent press that serves the community. 87% there's some other force or some other control over the independence of that press. And the, ha the aha is this. If you draw the correlation between individual freedoms and the freedom of the press around the world for people, they're direct. They are direct. And so the notion that we don't figure this out is, is a heavy consequence. But in order to figure it out, we need to tell our own story. We need to invite people to support it. We need to let the average citizen know what's at stake. Because it's not their fault if they have been indifferent because we haven't talked about it. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I wanted to spend a few minutes, and how are we doing on time, Anna? 
Okay. I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about some of the things, though, that are happening, at least in the States and perhaps here in Greece or could, that are showing some promise in terms of revenue and nourishment. The first is the whole notion of the industry efforts. And you saw one of those here, where we're trying to work as an industry to get an ability to have legislation to negotiate with Facebook and Google, which is really important. So more of that is occurring. Also in the industry, which I don't think is a particularly good idea, is you see, again, in the States at least, a lot of consolidation. So the largest uh, newspaper company in the States, Gannett, uh, there was an announcement this morning that it looks like after a very, very um, ugly, if you will, my words, company owned by, run by hedge funds were trying to take over Gannett, um, and they have a track record of just cutting all of the expenses out of the news organization until there's almost nothing left. But today was announced that the second largest news company and Gannett are in merger talks. So consolidation is one of the other things that you see a lot of, where you have one organization that isn't doing very well, and you have another one that isn't doing very well, and they think if we get together, we'll do better. But the reality is that's very short term because what ends up happening is what? They come together and the primary benefit they get is some cost efficiency early on. But it doesn't do much of anything to change the dynamic in terms of increasing revenue. And unless and until we can increase the revenue streams, it won't be enough. So the government issue, the government issue in getting support for this legislation with Facebook and Google could have very, very good impact for all of us because it could change the dynamics now of how advertising dollars flow or at least give us the opportunity to be paid for our content. You know, Anna and I mentioned the notion of sins of our past. If you go back 25 years ago, most of our industries, most of what we do, we were pretty healthy, you know? We, we had paychecks, there was money coming in, it was somewhat of a growing industry. And then, sometime around the mid-90s, things started to change. And what changed was the introduction of the internet. And our sins of our past were twofold then. First, first, is we, the internet had a mantra that anything on the internet needs to be free, right? And so the distribution of our hard work needed to be free. So instead of paying that euro every day or that euro 50 every day, they could take and get that same content on the internet for free. Big mistake. But as an industry, we thought, well, that's just a cute little toy, that internet thing. It won't amount to much. So we don't care if it's free there. And by the way, we'll get some advertising dollars, and so that's how we'll make up for it. Fast forward, big mistake. The second sin of the past, though, was the fact that we not only gave away our content free, worse than that, we allowed other people to take our content, aggregate it, and distribute it themselves where they had no cost, they had no sweat equity. But they were then able to package all of our work and go sell it at a very low price because it didn't cost them anything. Which then brought the price of advertising down, which then actually um, fragmented the distribution of our own content. You know, I had, I had an attorney once I was working with to try to deal with antitrust on that, and it would be like if you, were, if you were a tailor and you made the best shirts in Athens, all handmade, and every day you had a team of people that were all great tailors too, and they came in and they made 100 shirts every day, and you were able to sell them for 20 euro, and they were shirts that everybody wanted, but somebody else could come up to your back dock take a stack of 15 of those shirts and walk down the street and sell them for a euro a piece. And they're making money. So those two sins of the past really hurt us. So if you think about today, the notion of now getting the government to help us renegotiate and protect our content, or at least have a share of the revenue for those who would distribute our content, is a critical issue. Actually, the UE is further ahead in dealing with the platforms, and you're probably aware of that, than the states are. And so I think that some of the sanctions and some of the things that are happening in the UE as it relates to distribution of our content are more encouraging and in the states we're going to school on that. 
But the other thing that is important, and I think I get a sense just looking at who's in the room, is that notion if it's not government and it's not consolidation, it's a notion of collaboration. And what is it you do well that we could benefit from each other? What are you learning that we could learn from? And I think that notion of collectively as an industry, instead of competing with one another, trying to find ways to collaborate is, becomes more important. Um, in terms of revenue streams, so how do you get your revenue today? Some people buy it off the stand, is that, and some advertising, are those the two? Are there others? Well, again, I think the notion of, and I'll end with the storytelling part, I think the real opportunities are this. Obviously, selling the paper and selling it at a fair price and make people appreciate it. Certainly, you know, my wife and I, we, um, we've been walking the streets every day and loving your city, and, but it gets a little warm and you want some water. And so we don't think twice about going and paying a euro for a bottle of water or 50, you know, uh, half a euro for a bottle of water. How much does it cost to produce a bottle of water? So that notion of getting paid for what we do becomes important. But in addition to subscription, and I think you have to get paid digitally too. So in talking with Anne and Demetrius, it sounds like the culture in Greece at this point, or in many places, some in the UE, it's not yet for the internet and paying for that. That can be to your benefit because it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it will happen. If that habit isn't there in the culture now, it will happen. And so the notion of learning very quickly how you build a digital subscription model now from people around the world who are doing it really well. And actually, again, there are some in Europe who are doing it really well. And the Wall Street Journal does it well. The New York uh, Times does it well. The Washington Post does it well. We do it OK. We're learning. That is something you need to do right away is invest in that. Two other thoughts, though. One, and we're going to experiment and roll this out this year. So if a, if, if a subscription digitally or a single copy paper that you buy costs you X amount of money, that's it, that's the transaction, we're done. We think there's a model where there's charity on top of that, or what we would call membership. So in the States, uh, there's public radio and public television. So NPR, if you're familiar with NPR, so NPR is largely supported by listeners or viewers who send money in to support what they do. And patrons, patrons. I call it patrons of a free press is the term that I want to use. I think as we begin to open up the conversation in our communities, that notion of can you pay us more? Will you support what we do? Becomes very, very powerful and important. So if we charge currently if you get the inquirer delivered to your home every day and we charge you $350 a year, let's say, maybe somebody could give us $1,000 a year because they like what we do. Why not, right? So that notion of subscription or purchase, membership layered on top of it or patronage layered on top of it becomes very, very valuable and can add up quickly. It's almost like ongoing crowdfunding for what it is you do. But in order for that to work, you have to create awareness. And the other thing on revenue I'd say before I go to storytelling is just that notion of um, events. So do you do events around your journalism? You know, we didn't do many, but it's now about, for us in Philadelphia, it's about $2 million a year. We've been at it for a couple of years. We want it to be at least $5 million of revenue in the next couple of years annually, because here's why. If you think about the notion of how important it is to serve the people in your community, and all of you are content experts, or you know experts in content of some subject matter, and you have the power to convene people. And it's something that we just haven't done very well as an industry. Small In the States, small niche publications like city magazines or business journals they made most of their revenue off of events, but they were smaller players in the market. So if you think about it, you're subject experts in some subjects. You have great contacts and sources. You have credibility, and you have a large audience. All of those things are perfect. If you were, if you were trying to line up, if I wanted to get into the business of events, what would I need to have? Well, I'd probably need to have 
something important to say or to, 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 uh, to program. I'd probably need some experts to help me with it. I'd probably need to be able to get the word out. You know, I'd probably need to be able to support the sponsors with some, some uh, promotion, all of which you have in your toolkit today. So I think the notion of events, and again, it's happening all over our industry, both in the UE and in the States, where it's becoming a, not just a revenue stream, it's becoming a connection between the readers in our community and our journalism. It's becoming a connection. And it's opening the eyes for our journalists to actually get out there and meet more people and learn from them. Because increasingly, today, particularly the millennial generation, they don't want a relationship with a product. They want a relationship with the person. They want a relationship with the journalists. They want to feel like they know that person. They want to feel like they're human, that they've connected with them. And so I'll close with what I think is the most important thing. And that's the notion of storytelling. And I, I had the opportunity to speak at our industry conference in Las Vegas a few months ago as the, the keynote speak. And I was trying to think, what am I going to talk I mean, What do I have to say? What am I going to talk about? And the aha for me, preparing for that, was this. We have the best story possible to tell for a default dead industry. For a default dead industry, much of which we brought on ourselves with sins of the past, much of which was out of our control with the platforms and distribution and cultural changes and consumer habit changes and competitive, all of those things may be out of our control. But we're in the business of storytelling, right? And we are the worst storytellers in the world telling our own story. Remember what I talked about, what's at stake if we fail? The notion of people's individual freedoms, of bad things happening in communities that we help uncover, of things that we help uncover that might make somebody's life a little better in terms of those habits. All of that could go away. I was telling Anna, the Wall Street Journal had a deep investigative piece three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago on a Saturday, and it said that in the United States, within three to five years, almost every newspaper could be out of business. That's how desperate it is. So Jerry Lindfest used to say, in a community, is the art museum important? Yes, then you should support it. And people do. In a community, is education important? Yes. And you should support it. And people do. In a community, is any of it any more important than the independent investigative and service journalism being produced by our journalists, which is deeply threatened? No. Nothing is more important or any more important than we need to support it. The onus, I believe, and this is what I believe strongly, the onus is not on our readers or our citizens. The onus is on us to be more aggressive in our storytelling, to remind people of that value proposition that we create or try to create every day. We don't always get it right. But we come to work every day to try to make people's lives better and to protect them in a way that nobody else can protect them. There is, and, and I shared with you a few things, there is a cause and an effect to what we do every day. There is a cause and an effect. If we do good journalism, there is a tangible outcome of that journalism in our communities. And guess what? We just do it and we don't talk about it. So why should we expect the citizens to appreciate that? Secondly, there are surveys that show the majority of citizens think that media is in great financial shape. People are not aware of what is going on. So we have taken, with our unique structure, and I'm just adamant about it, we are going to become the best storytellers, not just about investigative and service journalism in our community. We are going to tell our community about who we are, why we're there every day, and why we hope that we're of value to them but importantly, we're going to ask them for their support because we need their financial support. We need their financial support or we go away. 
And if we go away, there are bad things in their community. And so it isn't just a marketing campaign either. It's a relationship storytelling ongoing campaign to earn their trust and earn their support. And that support can be buying the paper every day. That support can be buying the paper plus patronage. That support could be a $100,000 grant from somebody who's willing and able to do that. But it's on us to start telling that story more. So I showed you a few examples here of things that we've done recently. We'll have another one coming out next week. But it's simple. It's on our Sunday paper. It's a four-page section. And in it, we tell a little bit of, does some of you, does everybody see these? I shared two of them. They're just four pages, and they have different themes, but in each of them, we remind our people of recent journalism that we've done. And because we did these stories, here are the things that happened in our community. We're gonna quit being shy and assume that people value what we do. We are going to show them what we do and why we do it, and we're gonna ask for their support. And it's changing the way we think about it in the newsroom, and it also says we can't just sit behind our desks, we've gotta be out in our communities more often. And we need to talk about what's at stake. So I'll, I'll close with this last video because again, we have another one of these coming out. Oh, and what's interesting is, <coughs> My wife and I, we have three great kids. And so the first edition, I had a, a letter from, that I wrote to our readers on the front page. And at the end, the people who were helping me edit it, they said, you, would you want to hear from readers? And I said, well, of course, you know. And uh, we have about just over a, a, about uh, 750,000 readers a week, right? And so they're like, do you want to hear from them if they have something to say? Yeah, sure, why not? So they put on there, do you guys know this? You know, at the end it said, and so ANA, or AMA, AMA. Do you know what that means? I didn't know either, so you're gonna learn something new. What's it mean, Anna? No. What's it mean? Ask me anything, ask me anything. So we put this section out and, and it said, I said, here's my email, ask me anything. And one of my kids said to me, Dad, are you nuts? Are you nuts? I hope you have a team of 20 people prepared to answer that. And I thought, what? what? People lit up our emails. They lit up writing us letters. People wanted to be engaged. And so while a lot of it wasn't pleasant, much of it was. But what it shows is there's a hunger for that relationship. And we need to do more of that. So in addition to these things, we're producing videos to help tell our story too. So I'll end with that video and open it questions. I want to show you a little of Philadelphia. We are watchdogs. We're diggers. We like to dig. We worry about the same things that other people worry about, like are our, our neighborhood safe, are our, our school safe, are our, our kids safe. Justice has been done. We're your neighbor, we're your mother, we're your aunt, we're your teacher. We are Philadelphia. We are the region. We're here for the Delaware Valley and that's just how it's going to be, and how it's always going to be. We're just storytellers. That's what we do. Introducing Philadelphia to other Philadelphians and introducing Philadelphia to the world. We're not just a person with a notebook. We're out there. There's no better way to to get to know a city and the people and the issues than asking people questions and being curious. There's so many people to meet and everyone has a story. We're going to St. Miriam's Church, which is in Flower Town. I try to sort of be in all kinds of neighborhoods all over the city, hearing these stories, telling them I'm interested. People are amazing. To be able to chronicle that is just such a privilege. There are times where I'm just like, I can't believe, like, you know, you get paid for this. We put new 
produce anywhere from 800 to 1,000 pieces of content in a given week. And it's produced every day by 250 journalists. And then the mass support network is a The delivery of the news was the thump on the front porch. That's how you know that the news had arrived. It's so far beyond just the newspaper in the morning and whatever nightly news broadcast that you watch. The different products that we've introduced makes it so that no matter where people are looking to consume journalism, we're there and available in that realm. It's allowed us to create more value for our readers. When you look at our region, we are actually competing with all the major national outlets. For us, really, in that space, it's the ability to dominate local coverage. Local news is really important. And then in local news, you can find all the big things that everyone else cares about. Being a sports writer in Philadelphia, there's weight to that, there's gravity to that. But whether you like it or not, Philadelphia will adopt you and brand you. <laughs> The relationship between Philly and sports is something between a mania and a religion. It's not always pleasant, it's not always nice, it's not always logical, but it's real and it's palpable. We are the Philadelphia Inquirer. The founder of this institution in 1829 named it the Inquirer because he said the people deserve somebody asking on its behalf the hard questions. The Inquirer is both the chronicler of what happens in our region and a mirror to the community. It all started with a curiosity of whether Philadelphia had a problem and it turned out that our gut was right that Philadelphia has a real problem with lead paint. We learned that kids in Philadelphia are actually poisoned at much higher rates than in Flint, Michigan. We started with that question. Why? Why are Philadelphia kids being exposed to so much lead? And that just began a three-year journey that went from schools to playgrounds to people's homes and back again. We got dirt cleaned up in the room. These are Pulitzer Prize winners. We got a new wall too. that schools have to be lead safe. We got more funding for schools. That's more rewarding than anything when you feel like your story had an impact and made a difference. It's very satisfying. It's the reason so many of us do what we do. The most rewarding part about my job is getting to put stories into my region's paper of record that reflect the Philadelphia that I grew up with. I'm from Mount Airy. I grew up my whole life in the Northwest uptown. The reputation of the Inquirer wasn't the greatest in my community. There were a lot of notions that the Inquirer didn't always give the due attention to people of color in the city to black people in the city. We have to be able to speak to the different communities. And we have not always been good at that. That's something that we are trying really hard to work on, making sure that people can sort of see themselves in those who are telling the stories. It takes more work. It takes more research. It takes outreach. It just takes pounding more pavement. Those barriers are absolutely worth breaking through. We have a platform that many people don't have. We have an ability to amplify their stories and their causes and their issues in a way that most people don't have. Figuring out what is going on in the community and how you can contribute to answering those questions. That's the value that I think a journalist can provide. You can turn to the paper and see yourself reflected in it and see what you care about is what we care about.
And again, that's a piece that uh, our own team uh, just put together, but it's just part of the ongoing, whether it's print, we do this uh, digitally, we do videos, but we're just getting out more. And at the end of all of this kind of storytelling, we have to get better and better and better at the ask for the support. And it's incredible how many people have been willing to support us, but they've never been asked before. And so I think that same thing can resonate with journalists around the world. I think that we are underappreciated, but I don't think that we've been advocates ourselves of our own work. And I think that fundamentally has to change both in a collective sense, whether it's you know with, with government, but it also I think it really, really comes down to the individual, whether that individual is extremely wealthy and is part of a foundation or that individual is just an everyday person and going, and as we talked about, if I'll pay that euro for my espresso, am I willing to pay for that journalism that so much work went into to try to be of value to me? And that's the, that's the connection that we all need to make. So again, I'll, I'll end with that and uh, be happy to open it up for any questions if we're okay on time. I'm so appreciative of your attentiveness through this. Um, I was anxious about speaking to you because it's a real honor to do so. And, uh, and you were very attentive, and I do appreciate that. So, but anything you have a question about, I'd be happy to, to try to answer. Uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, paradoxes. It's not, it's not working. <laughs> Here, you want to borrow mine? Hello? Hello? There you go. Okay, there seems to be a lot of paradoxes with uh, innovation, technology, and the news, and legacy newspapers. You need, aren't, don't we need the technology to distribute and to work as an as a innovative news business? Yep. And how do you feel about the big players such as Google uh, being one of these philanthropists or supporting uh, whether it's giving money to the news organizations, or news organizations like Knight Ritter or whatever, and um, also giving the applications which you guys need to run on. Yep. Well, I'll go to this um, just to answer that. So, so did everybody hear the question? That notion about technology is important too, as a part of this, and so it isn't just a matter of the storytelling, but, but for example, in this, that's why this is one of our three pillars. And so it's not just your own ability because technology is something that's very difficult to scale at every individual. So collaboration with technology becomes important. The two organizations that have the most, so right today, since Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, <clears throat> the Washington Post, New York Times, if you go back six years ago, where they were on their, they were default debt. They were in big trouble. And they have revitalized themselves pretty remarkably, their brand, their audience growth, their subscription growth, their revenue growth, pretty substantially. But the Washington Post right now has, I think, 700 journalists in their newsroom. They have over 350 tech and engineer and product people. So Bezos has built out this massive engine of engineering and tech people to be able to distribute and develop the journalism. Um, and so their content management system, system called ARC uh, we use it now. They've licensed it to over 100 news organizations. So that's becoming, they created it. They created it. Now, I'll come to that in a minute. So, so being able to, as an independent one-off, it's very difficult to create the scale you need in tech. So having good partners there become important. But in this space, because as an industry, before we got to this legislation, we've been kind of playing good cop, bad cop with Google and Facebook. So Google and Facebook have, have donated, like uh, each of them, about $300 million to news organizations in the UE and in the States in the last couple of years. They've committed that kind of money to try to help us with innovation. So to us, it's kind of like, look, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little cash to buy you off here if you'll just go away and leave me alone to make $60 billion Here's 300 million. Does that make you happy? But in, in seriousness, though, that 300 million that they've invested in it is really helping us because it's teaching us best practices about how to get subscriptions. It's teaching us reader engagement and best data to try to utilize. It's teaching us things in the newsroom, how to utilize some of Google's best tools, be able to tell stories. So there are real values there. Because here's the, here's the, the truth. 
Google and Facebook, particularly Facebook, I would argue, and maybe not, maybe not accurately, but their business model, I don't think it ever, ever anticipated that journalism would become as important to them as it is. And so when you look, particularly at Facebook, at the number of people who get their news through Facebook, put it another way, the number of people who use Facebook use it for news. So they have become addicted to our content. And I don't think they anticipated that. But right now, they're getting all the monetization for that content. So I had a colleague once who said, picture a world in which all journalists for a month didn't give Facebook any of their content. What do you think would happen with Facebook? And so I think that's one of the reasons they're willing, because they need the industry to do well. They just want us to be like, <gasps> we're still alive, but not breathing and healthy, right? And so we're trying to renegotiate to get breathing and healthy again. They need us alive. Are there questions? My name is Nikos Bakunakis. I am the head of the Department of Communication, Media and Culture here in Athens at the Pan nice to meet University. You, but I also I teach um, um, a distance learning class on local and hyper-local and community journalism at the Open University of Greece, where the, um, I have the attendees, the students are mostly practitioners. So for, um, the local press uh, has a long tradition in my country, here in Greece, and uh, the um, older print and newspaper nowadays um, dates uh, back to the end of the 19th century. It is a local newspaper. It's uh, published in Patras, the, the main city in the Peloponnese. So I have a question. How uh, this community-oriented uh, newspaper press uh, shapes new journalistic values and uh, which uh, those values are. How do we shape the local journalistic values? Yes. Uh, related to the content, to the different, the conflict, the community's conflicts. Right. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's kind of like instead of me determining without asking you what you're interested in or what's important to you, what you're going to have for dinner tonight, I think it's that notion of understanding the issues that are really important to people in a broad sense and the commitment to tell that, that journalism. But I think it's also understanding that we can never win on the national and international journalism stage. That's not, our, that's not our core competency. Our core competency is local, local, local news. Because the New York Times could never come into Philadelphia and cover Philadelphia, even with all of their resources, like we can. We have 250 journalists covering Philadelphia. So we have to be local in everything that we do, and we have to be authentic in everything we do, and we have to measure, because we can now, are people really engaging with what it is we write? Does it matter to them? Um, and then even the national and international stories, how do, we, how do we put a local lens on that? So if this is happening in Europe, or this is happening in, in uh, California, what does it mean to you here in Philadelphia? And so that it's something somebody can't get anywhere else. So there was a great book, as we think about our industry, there's a great book maybe 20 years ago now uh, by two guys from Harvard, uh, Collins and Porus were their names, and the book was called Built to Last. And I thought it was fantastic. Some of you have read it nodding heads. But of all the good things in that book, the thing that never left, it's like a tattoo on me. I don't have any tattoos, but if I did, this is one impression, was that, that organizations that survive over many decades through technological changes, competitive changes, changes in consumer habits, organizations that survive all of that, the one thing they have in common is they understand their core competency deeply. And a core competency is something that you do so well that it's difficult for somebody else to replicate, right? And so too often in our industry, people assumed that our core competency was printing and distributing a newspaper. That was never our core competency. 
our core competency has always been gathering information for and about our communities. Because nobody else can come in and gather information for and about our communities at the level and the expertise that we can. And then it can be distributed regardless of what the technology is, regardless of what the consumer habit is. But that whole notion of core competency is gathering information for and about your local market. And if you think about it that way, that's important. Now you need to understand how do you make the receiver, the audience, appreciate that relationship and be willing to support it. And again, I'll go back to, if we don't ask them, it's our fault, not theirs. If they're indifferent, it's our fault, not theirs. They can't come to the party if they've not been invited. Okay? Yes? First of all, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. My name is Betty Tsekaraistu. I am uh, Associate Professor uh, at Brentani University, colleague with uh, Nikos Balamenkis. And one of the courses I do <coughs> efforts is on entrepreneurial journalism and media innovation. So I really enjoyed that she talked the language of innovation, mm -hmm. of startups, of value propositions, of engagement, <coughs> of how actually we rebuild and we rethink our model in order to thrive in present, but also have a future in yes. that. All right. So I would like to focus, because you are the leader, the CEO, mm -hmm. how you create in your own organization a, a culture and also, I mean, organizational culture and the practices among your colleagues, the journalists, and also other people who are joining your team in order to empower such a perspective and everyday practice yep. forward. Okay, this is the question. So how the qu you do the change from inside out? Thank you. The question is, how do you infuse innovation in your organization, both with time, resource, and permission, yes, exactly. to able to help you to evolve? Yes. Well, part of it is, and again, in our structure, we're fortunate because in the Linfest Institute, we have a, a lab. And so that lab is funded for experimentation, and it partners with our newsroom directly. And so we're always running experiments, particularly around mobile and try and turn, turn new things in the mobile. But one of the cautions I would have is that is where collaboration, I think, becomes extremely important between news organizations in terms of innovation. If you think about it, not many of us compete as much anymore. So at least in the States, the newspaper in Dallas, Texas, the newspaper in Boston, Massachusetts, the newspaper in Seattle, Washington, the newspaper in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the newspaper in Philadelphia, we all look a lot alike. We don't compete with one another, but we have very limited resources. And so what we do is we're trying to pool all of our teams together to put a pot of money together for innovation that can serve all of us. And that's what the Institute is. So if we put money together, the Institute will match that. And then whatever it is we learn through that innovation is shared with everybody openly. So I think when it comes to innovation, unless you have extremely big resources, collaboration to get those resources becomes important. And I think that that notion of continuing to do it, that was one of the sins of our past. Because when news organizations were printing money, we never had R&D departments, ever, ever, ever. All we did is just stuffed our pockets with profits. You know, but we never created, we never, in, you know, evolved. I think that's one we had to learn from. But it's funny because the two professors, when I said book to, the built to last, both of you shook your heads. So, <laughs> academic. <laughs> Any last? Yes. I am also a practitioner. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. This gentleman. Yes. Um, as a, a publisher, I'd like to know why, uh, not how. Uh, you made your uh, readership, you motivated your readership to uh, donate money uh, to improve your business. Uh, from my point of view, uh, there's a, a lack of credibility in Greece, and that has to do with uh, uh, also with politics that has gone, you know, the credibility has gone downside uh, the last few years, maybe decades. Uh, but I'd, I'd be interested to, to know how, uh, what, what was the percentage of uh, your income, your input, uh, from um, uh, readers, donations in 2015 when you took over the leadership of the, uh, the organization and what it is today and how you 
you, you process that, how you, you made the leap, if there is yep. a leap, what the percentage of uh, this income is today. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 2015, it was zero. So in 2016, it was zero. Um, zero. zero. Uh, and again, when Jerry Lindfest set up the new structure and he endowed first $20 million and then he created a $40 million matching fund so that if another donor in the community, a foundation or an individual would give money, he would match it. And part of that, that match could be to the endowment, making the endowment bigger so that it went on and then 5% of the endowment every year can be used for the Institute's work, which supports us in some ways with new projects. Or, or we could, working with the Institute, go to a local organization or a local individual and ask them for support for a project like our investigative team. Remember, we doubled the size of uh, one investigative team. We went to individuals in the community. We told them what we wanted to do. So we were able to raise about $300,000. That was then matched by Jerry. So it creates a pool of $600,000 to pay for that. We created a brand new going from two people in the state capitol covering it to now we'll have 12, okay? That was a million dollars a year. We went to five or six different donors, told them the plan, asked them for their support, received their support, all of that. So all in right now, annually, and those are, those are more big dollar donations. On the sheets that I handed out to you, on the back pages, you see a list of names of people who just in the last six months have become kind of patrons, if you will. And those are individuals who give anywhere from $2,500 or more a year up. And some of them have given, you know, uh, $300,000 or so. So some of that money goes to the Institute for endowment. Some of that money goes directly to, uh, through the Institute to us for special projects. Right now we're counting on next year for special projects a couple of million dollars. We have not yet begun the what I call the membership or the subscription plus program. So we want to try to start that by the beginning of next year. And we, I think, and I could be wrong because I'm wrong a lot, I think that's going to be really big. And I think it's the future that all of us need to depend on. People don't know if you don't ask them. So if you're willing to ask them. The woman, there's a woman, Meredith, she's the chief operating officer of the New York Times. And she says, we're learning. There are some people who can barely pay us and afford to pay us for their annual subscription, but they want it. There are other people who read us every day who would gladly pay us $100,000 a year for their subscription. We're trying to find a way to get all of them to be able to participate at the level they want to and our ability to, to do so. That's what we're trying to accomplish. Yes, follow up. background in these uh, donations? I mean, do you, have you ever received a, a sort of uh, uh, some, someone who tried to interfere with and your content? Yes. I was trying to Perfect. be polite. Thank you. And no, no, no. Uh, Thank you for that. That, that is the elephant. That is the big exactly. question. And we have to. It is so, so we have the largest health insurance organization in the city of Philadelphia. It's called Independence Blue Cross, a huge, you know, six billion, seven billion dollar company. They have given us twenty-five hundred dollars, excuse me, two thousand five hundred dollars each year the last few years. They have zero say. We will not take a dollar from anyone, and and we tell people up front, you have zero, zero say or influence in our coverage. We won't take a dollar from you if you're telling us how to cover something. Now, that said, if we had the orchestra and, or the opera, and so we were running low on money, and so we may have to lose the critic. It's like the university, you have an endowed chair. So we would be open to a donor giving us amount of money for an endowed chair, if you will, equivalent, for a classical music critic or for that because Otherwise, we may not be able to afford that. But they would have no influence on what that critic wrote. None. 
It's a non-starter. So, uh, in the back, and then I'll come here. Sorry. Hi, my name is Amy Williams. I'm an American Hi, Amy. <laughs> from California. Um, Where in I'm California? Uh, Los Angeles. Where in Los Angeles? Culver City. <laughs> okay. All right. I worked at Santa Monica Outlook was oh, one of my great. stops years oh, ago. Very yeah. local right. newspaper. Um, I wanted to address your third prong of diverse and growing audiences. Um, I run an NGO that trains young women in citizen journalism around the world, and I'm sitting with three of my trainees here, oh, refugee girls um, living in Athens. So we're really excited to be here and hear from Welcome. you. Welcome. Um, and I'm just uh, always curious in my work about news literacy among the younger generation and how we've really lost it. And I think this is a global issue. Um, and what legacy newspapers and organizations, uh, news organizations are doing to address the younger generation. And this is really a diverse and growing audience that is demanding different types of reporting from um, news organizations, and they are not reading newspapers. They're right. not really reading. Right. <laughs> They're right. texting well, and yeah. interacting on, on platforms. Yeah. Um, platforms. But they are hungry for news, and they are really interested in journalism. So. Yep. Well, thank you for asking that, because I didn't dive into this deep, but, but in this category, and back to the question about funding, and, and uh, again, welcome to your young journalists there. We, one of the projects we did, and we're in our second year of it, is we, through foundation or through an individual donation, we have six full-time fellows on two-year fellowships. And it turns out and that, that we wanted them all to be minority. It turns out all six were women. Um, all six are young millennial journalists with experience. And they are telling us and teaching us, our, our more legacy newsroom, how do you story tell in what forms and what formats and what platforms to be able to reach young, younger audiences. The unanticipated challenge we have is we've infused our newsroom with some 50 or 60 new young millennial journalists and a backdrop of a lot of really, really talented season, senior uh, uh, seasoned journalists and the culture conflict there on a daily basis is really surprising. It's really surprising. And it's one of the things we're, wow, we didn't anticipate that we're learning from. But I think that for us, I don't think that we, you know, this, this old white guy isn't going to be able to go out and tell our newsroom how we could tell better stories to reach a younger community where they are and have it be meaningful. Those fellows that we brought in, the new journalists that we hire, our interaction and learning from them, I think is the opportunity for us. That's why the investment needs to be there. Otherwise, I think, I think we're phony. So I think we need to go and, be, and invest in authentic and learn from it. But thank you for the question. I, I think we're running out of time. Is there any? Yes, yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Eva, also an American, sorry. Um, That's, don't be sorry about being American. It's OK. It's OK. It's OK. No. And your name? My name is Eva. Um, Eva. I work to set up investigative and data teams um, in the rest of the Freedom House countries you talked about. So yep. in Pakistan and Kenya and Afghanistan. Um, and what I wanted to know is a little bit your insider view on having conversations with other publishers and editors. Because what we encounter a lot is they know they're dead by default and they're gonna go out producing a bunch of clickbait and scandal stories which you've seen manifest in the elections and populist yeah. elections, and they're not, and telling them that, well, why don't you rethink your business model? Why don't you pivot to public interest? Yeah. Um, so what do you, I mean, and there must be similar conversations happening among publishers yeah. and editors in legacy US newsrooms, and what do you say to those that are reluctant? They see kind of Yep. The end is nigh, and what do you tell them to, to invest in actual the quality journalism part and diversity and technology and not technology just for the sake of clickbait? Th thank you. That is a great, great question. And, and it's funny because the whole notion, even the term clickbait, you know, it's like, it's a pretty negative term, right? Pretty true. It's like, it's like paywall is a pretty negative term. A subscription, why can't it be a subscription? But leave it to journalists to, when we talk about ourselves, we come up with the worst descriptors, you know, paywall and clickbait. But in seriousness, I believe that that whole notion of driving just traffic, clickbait, to get high numbers of traffic, that was the mistake. Because remember when I went back to clickbait is not indispensable. 
Clickbait is not a differentiator. Clickbait is not something that becomes important in the community. Clickbait doesn't serve the soul of a journalist, right? Of why are we here? And so I think it's the anti-clickbait. And I think the notion of if you really want to have engagement, become indispensable, be worth paying for, be a habit that people want to have, you know, it's, it's, it's not Snickers bars, right? It's something a lot healthier than that. And the notion of, I think that is, so when I talk to my colleagues, that's kind of an aha, and it's refreshing to know that. It would have been so disappointing if clickbait had been the answer, right? In order to save the, the economic business model, we've got to trade our souls for money to save the business model, when in fact, the opposite is true. And so the purest form of what we want to do and why we're here is ultimately what, if we can convey the value proposition and our storytelling, is what will save us, I believe. And the other thing is, we can't fail, you know? We're default dead, but we can't die. We just can't let it happen. And I think it's the SOS to our communities about that. So that sense of urgency has to be there. We don't have a lot of time. So, are we done on time? Okay. I'll close with, can I tell you one quick story? Has anyone ever heard of the Pulitzer Prizes? The Pulitzer Prizes? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Pulitzer Prizes. All right? Yeah, okay. So the Pulitzer Prizes, and this is my favorite story. So about, it was 1996, was it 96, Randy? So I was working in Tucson, Arizona. I was a young guy then. I was one, young once, I was. And I had little bitty kids and all this stuff. And I worked in Tucson, Arizona. And in Tucson, Arizona, there were two newspapers. One was owned by Gannett, and one was owned by the Pulitzer family. The, the, that Pulitzer family, Joseph Pulitzer's family. So, and they had asked me to come to St. Louis to interview for a job to, to be the general manager of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which was the Joseph Pulitzer's original first newspaper. So I was a little intimidated, right? I was a young kid, I don't know anything. I was just a, a young pup in the business. So, so I agreed to fly there, but I loved where I lived, and I had little kids, but I agreed to fly there. So I put the kids to bed that night, Rennie and I did, and I was anxious about the flight early in the morning, and so I was turning the TV on, I was flipping around the TV, and suddenly it came across, do you get the biography channel in, in Greece? Just flip, I never watched the biography channel. It turns on, the, and the biography channel's on, it was the top of the hour, and the show was just starting. And the serendipity of this moment in my life, that show, it was the debut of Pulitzer, a prize-winning story. And I went, you gotta be kidding me. You know, I always tell my wife, you know, there'll, there'll be a sign. If it's meant to be, there'll be a sign. I thought that was a pretty good sign, right? <laughs> so the morning before I'm gonna fly to meet with the Pulitzers, I'm watching this. And I sit there and I watch it, and the best story came out of that because it has to do with fake news, right? Nobody asked me about fake news today, and I was sure, I was sure somebody would ask me about fake news. How long has fake news been around? A uh, long time. Yeah, a long time. So here's the story. Joseph Pulitzer comes over from uh, Hungary, and it's during the Civil War, and he's a gangly, geeky guy who's a brainiac, but he wants to be a soldier. So he enlists in the, in the army, and he's a soldier in the Civil War, and he's a terrible soldier. The war ends, and he ends up by you know, happenstance in St. Louis, Missouri. And he eventually he gets a job at the newspaper as a reporter, and he's covering a beat, which is the state capitol. Then he also becomes a local congressman. So it's weird. So he's a congressman, a state, con state congressman, and he's a reporter. He ends up getting an argument with somebody, and this person is a bully, and he shoots him in front of all these people. And so he shoots a man in front of all these other people, and he doesn't go to jail because they said, well, the guy deserved it. So he gets off. Fast forward. He ends up making some friends, he parlays some money, and he buys this newspaper, the St. Louis, and he merges two papers, the Post and the Dispatch. So the original Joseph Pulitzer's original paper, the Post-Dispatch. And he's running that newspaper, and he wants it to be a very progressive newspaper. And so he's going to take on, and he's going to do investigative reporting, and he's going to hold the powerful accountable on behalf of the people, all of these things. And so he upsets a lot of the establishment in the old St. Louis city. And so the politicians don't like him, the business leaders don't like him, et cetera. So one particular day, a story ran 
one of the most prominent people in town, came into the offices very upset, very angry, and got into a fight and an argument with the editor of the paper. And so back then, you know, in the 1800s, what do you do? The editor shot him and killed him in the office. So Joseph Pulitzer decided now might be a pretty good time to get out of town for a while. So he goes to New York, and he's going to be just kind of laying low in New York City for a few months to get away from it. And while he's in New York City, he finds this dying newspaper, default dead newspaper, called the New York World. And he buys it for next to nothing. And so he stays in New York, and Joseph Pulitzer really creates modern journalism, the modern US newspaper with the New York World. Because he understood, and he built that paper for the assimilation of the masses of immigrants who were coming to this country. And so in addition to having hard news in the paper, he introduced features. He introduced things that help people's everyday life in the New York world. And it rapidly became the number one newspaper in the world in terms of copies sold. And every day on the New York world, on the front page, he had a little cartoon called The Yellow Kid. And it was like, uh, I don't know, it was just a, a little, the antics of the yellow kid. So it was a habit. Everybody had to see, what did the yellow kid do today? So come along this fantastically uh, great success story of a newspaper, The New York World. And if you've ever seen the movie or the play Newsies, it's about Joseph Pulitzer and The New York World. There's another guy who comes to see Joseph Pulitzer, and he had dropped out of Harvard University, and his father was in the business. And his father thought it would be good if he learned something from Pulitzer, so he did. And Pulitzer took him in, and he taught him a lot of things. This fellow said, well, I'm going to go down the street and get my own newspaper. And so he did. And I can't remember the name of that newspaper now. But these two newspapers began to battle each other every day. There were a lot of other newspapers, but these two battled each other every day, trying to one-up each other. So much so that the competitive newspaper put their own little yellow kid on the front page every day. And they started making the journalism more and more and more sensational. To which historians say the War of 1812, or excuse me, the, the Spanish-American War, was started by false reports out of these two newspapers because they were going to do anything to one-up each other and not get beat. So truth be damned, we need to be first. And so, fast forward, have you ever heard the term yellow journalism or sensationalism? It comes from the yellow kid. And so Joseph Pulitzer, before he died, Joseph Pulitzer, before he died, reflected and realized what he had done in this sensationalism, what he had done with fake news, what he had done, and how he had damaged journalism and what it was meant to be. And so before he died, he endowed the very first graduate school program for journalism because he wanted to elevate the professional of journalism to a higher level and a higher standard. So he endowed the Columbia School of Journalism graduate program first, and he forever endowed the Pulitzer Prizes to serve as a reminder to journalists around the world what it is we do, why we do it, and the standards we should uphold. And I just thought that was a pretty powerful story. So I'll, lend, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.